Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Peter Hunt. Um, we're just about to get started there, so I'm just going to ask uh, Mary McNamee to uh, give an introduction to today's content. Hi everyone, um, my name is Mary McNamee from Limerick Chamber. Thank you all so much for attending to afternoon, I was going to say it's this morning, this afternoon's webinar, um, kindly hosted by Action Point. So hopefully this is going to give us all a great insight into Microsoft 365 Teams and how we can be a little bit more secure in our remote working. So, and any questions and stuff, um, please pop them in there to the questions box on the right-hand side. So, I, without further ado, Finian, I'll let you get started. So I might just jump in there first, uh, just for a quick introduction, and um, before we hand over to the main speaker, thank you, Mary. Uh, delighted to present to the chamber um, chamber members today on this uh, very topical subject, Microsoft 365. Um, as I said, my name is Peter Hunt, um, and just a little bit of background on Action Point. Um, we've been uh, we're an IT services and software development company, so we're uh, really at the really in the throes of, of of this remote working discussion at the moment and at the coal face. Um, we've got offices across the island of Ireland, and we provide uh, managed IT services software development uh, to companies large and small. We're a Microsoft Gold Certified Partner, um, and within that skill set, of course, uh, we deal a lot with Office and Microsoft 365. Um, so we're well positioned uh, to facilitate this discussion today. Um, if you have any questions or queries, as Mary said, just put them in the questions box. Um, Finian also has his details on his slideshow as well. Um, we welcome um, any, any questions or feedback that you may have. Um, before we kick off today, um, I'm just going to I'm just going to launch a, a quick poll here, um, and it's just to get an understanding of um, people's remote working challenges at the moment. So I'm just going to take a couple of seconds. I'm going to pop that poll on screen, and if you want to pick your biggest challenge you're experiencing with regards to remote working, I'll save that up for for 20 or 30 seconds or so. And just a quick reminder, um, if anyone's having audio uh, difficulties, um, if you go to the help button at the top of your screen um, and and go to go to sound uh, check, um, you, you should be able to set up your speakers and um, they should be set to your desktop or laptop. Okay, uh, just a couple more seconds on the poll, so get your answers in. Um, perfect. So I'm going to hand over to Finian now, um, who's going to take you through today's content. Finian is our head of Microsoft Cloud Services and is going to talk to you today about Microsoft 365. Over to you, Finian. Thanks, Peter. Uh, good morning, everyone, or actually good afternoon at this stage. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we've got a lot of content to go through here today, and, and I'm going to, uh, I suppose, bring it down to the remote working level. I'm, I'm really put the remote working slant on this as much as possible to make it relevant to everyone here. As Peter said, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the questions box and we'll answer them as best we can uh, towards the end. So what are we going to cover today? So first of all, I want to talk briefly about uh, a little bit about teamwork and how the landscape has, has changed for everyone. We want to go into discussing about Microsoft 365 and look at it from two key angles. One is how it can help you and your team with productivity and collaboration given the new world that we're in right now but also very much focus in on how we can do this securely because often that is something that that has been forgotten so to talk a little bit teamwork and, and this is a slide i've been using for probably the last 12 to 18 months when i've been speaking with customers and really the, the numbers in here are have been blown out of the water in, in the last few weeks in terms of the expectation right now is that everyone is, is remote working and we're expected to collaborate dramatically with our teams um, and, and with our colleagues. Uh, people are now working from different locations and you know, while previously that might have been airports, hotels, places like that, we're now working from our bedrooms, our kitchens, anywhere at all we can get connectivity and, and get a bit of silence. But we have also, we're also in a scenario where people have been thrown into the deep end on this. Many of us have never worked remotely before. We haven't had a, a training course or a long lead into this where we've you know, built up the knowledge to be able to work effectively from home. So this is brand new for a lot of people. 
And if we look across our, our individual teams and, and the people we work with, the skill set across that team is, is very, very different. So it can, can become a challenge for that. So it, it's on us as, as colleagues and business owners to try and simplify that as much as possible and really try and help people do their job and leverage technology like the technology we're going to talk about today to do that in, in as best a way as possible. So looking at teamwork for a lot of businesses right now, I often ask the question, what does it look like today? And what we're finding in reality is it's very disjointed. Again, going back to the fact that this is new for a lot of businesses, things are, you know, things have taken off very, very rapidly. And people have had to scramble to, to find tools to video conference with, to share files with, to manage projects with, to basically do their job. All very, very well intention, intentioned, but it's created a lot of fragmentation across the, the ability and across the business. And often this has been compounded by our overall IT strategy. When we look at the focus of our business today, our, our focus is on our core business. It's maybe not on technology. And we've come from a background where we have legacy platforms, maybe no real technology strategy, and ultimately it allowed fragmentation. And that combined with this new world of work and new world of teamwork and collaboration means it's introduced a, a lot of risks on, into our business that we need to be very conscious of and that we actually need to start addressing very, very quickly because the threats are real out there. And often I get asked the question, well, why don't we have, why doesn't our business have the security we need? The reality is it's too complicated. You know, us as IT professionals have, have often made it very, very complicated or made it difficult for business to uh, secure their business properly because there's so many different products out there. At times it's become too expensive, you know, so many different products doing so many different things, it can become expensive. And like I've said earlier on, security is not a business priority. For our customers and, and, and for everyone on this call, the priority right now is keeping business going. It's, it's making sure your employees are looked after and making sure your customers are looked after. So it's very much on the back burner. But I suppose what we're trying to do today is, is trying to put that on the front foot, not to complicate it, not to complicate it, but ultimately keep it simple, but make sure your business is, is protected. And the reason we want to do that is that fragmented approach that we demonstrated there a minute ago really leads to business risk. And, and we see this continuously. And this, I suppose, is a new. This has been happening for a long, long time. However, it's more compounded given the fact that we're no longer in the, the security or the, the, the sense of security that's within the four walls of our office. We're now spread across various different locations. And if we look at some of the, the risk that, that is there to business right now, in terms of email risk, on average, you know, where a, a rogue email or a phishing email is sent, on average, three in 10 people open that email and one in 10 will probably click on the link that is within that email. Ultimately, because our guard is now dropped, you know, our threshold of, of knowing what's good or bad has dropped. And when that happens, you know, someone can get onto our networks, get access to our corporate data very, very rapidly. And often we find that they, they sit and, and, you know, stay inside our corporate network for up to 286 days. That combined with, I suppose, us being people and, and you know, us trying to do our jobs right now, uh, people are using weak passwords that are often stolen out there. We try to make them complicated, you know, and we're forced maybe by IT to change them once every three months or so. But the reality there is we come up with a complicated password and three months later, we add the number one or the number two at the end of it. Because, you know, as individuals, as humans, it's impossible for us to remember so many complicated passwords. 58% of people actually accidentally share information. 80% of people use different apps. The fundamental point underneath all of this is that none of this is malicious. All of this is people trying to do their jobs. They're trying to do things effectively. But from a business point of view, it's actually creating a lot of risk in our business. And we need to be conscious that it exists and that people are trying to exploit that. And even if we bring it down to a device level, how quickly devices can be compromised. You know, we've just handed out a new laptop to someone so that they can work from home. You know, have we actually sat back and thought, well, how secure is that laptop? How is that going to access our corporate network? How is that going to access our critical bit of piece of information? And if that laptop or that user's passwords get compromised by a phishing email, what are, you know, how are we protected against that? So often our message to customers right now, and I suppose going back for a long time, is really we need to up our game. We, we need to put this on on the, the, the front of our, our list of things to do and be on the offense on this rather than being on defense. And often the approach to overall IT security has been built on technology from 10, 15 years ago. You know, there's, there's a sense of if I have a firewall, if I have antivirus, well, then I'm OK. The reality is our, our world has changed dramatically, not, not only in the last few weeks, but over the last number of years. Everyone's using mobile devices. Employees are working from multiple places more so than ever. 
and we're seeing a prevalence of phishing, of ransomware and social, social engineering. So there's lots of new threats and new ways of, of attacking our business that are out there that we've never seen before. So that really sets the landscape on, you know, we're in, we're in a new position of teamwork. There's a lot of threats out there. So how do we go about improving our teamwork, getting collaboration better, and ultimately making sure we're doing it secure, securely? And really that's where Microsoft 365 comes in. So in thinking of Microsoft 365, we, we try to think of it in, in five key themes. And, and this goes back to the point of trying to make it simple, not, not to overly complicate it. We want to get more done. You know, as business owners, we want to try and get our job done, get the most out of it, and help our employees get more done on an ongoing basis. We want to try and work better together and, and ultimately build our business. We're in this whole new way of working. So we need to try and figure out ways of you know, doing some old tasks in a new, in a new, uh, in a new way of doing it. Ultimately, we want to safeguard our data and do all of that uh, in, in a safe environment, but ultimately make it simple for not only us as business owners, but also for our team, for our employees out there as well. So to dive into that in a little bit of detail, how does Microsoft uh, 365 help us to get more done? First and foremost, it gives us the office tools that we're familiar with, but it gives us those tools across any device, be it on a PC, laptop, but also on mobile devices, tablets. So any of the devices, any of those now home devices, that, that, that we uh, are, are working from uh, at home. So it gives us that, that same familiarity that we're used to. It also gives us the ability to access our files wherever we are. So we no longer need to worry about maybe VPN connections, sharing files over email, looking for data on a server that could be locked in our office that we no longer have access to. It gives us the flexibility to share that data with people on our team in a very, very easy fashion using links to share things rather than sharing physical files and folders or over email. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to get more done and get things done very, very effectively. It also gives us, I suppose, more intelligent tools. So simple things like sharing our presence, you know, having a green tick beside us to say, I'm available, or a red tick beside us to say, hey, I'm not available, maybe check my calendar or I can share my calendar with you so you can see when I'm available. Things like being able to collaborate on the same document at the same time. In other words, work or edit a document or an Excel file or a presentation at the same time. Gives us those tools to, I suppose, you know, accelerate how we work. And in an environment where we can't you know, turn around the corner or check, in on, check into someone's office, we're able to collaborate and work very, very effectively together uh, using the tools in Microsoft 365. In terms of working better together, really the key for that within Microsoft 365 is Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams is what they call a hub for teamwork. Now, what does that mean? I suppose if we think about how we work today, typically for a lot of business, businesses, people work on their email and they live and breathe by their email. All files come in, all conversations come in, everything is done over email. I then move from my email into my files, which is generally a network share, and maybe I have some other line of business application, you know, practice management system, CRM system, or something like that in between. But email is ultimately what I live and breathe by. The reality of that is that often the conversation and the information going back and forth over email gets lost. You know, I get so many emails in on a daily basis that I find it difficult to keep up with things. If I'm working on a piece of work with, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis, it becomes okay. But as I start to add in more people into that conversation or into that project or piece of work, it becomes very, very difficult to manage the conversation, the information change, and everything that, that goes with that, be it files or folders or other systems. So what Teams does is it, try to, it tries to centralize all of that communication, but not only centralize it, structure it. And it does that very, very effectively. And when we apply Teams to a remote working scenario, like we're all in right now, it gives a lot of advantage, advantages to our business. So, for example, it gives the ability at a simple level to do one-on-one -on -one and group instant messaging. So, if we think about the previous kind of one-liner emails and little pieces of information that we needed for people that would have gone over email, we're now able to do that via instant messaging, by a tool where we can see people's status. In other words, are they green? Are they online? Are they available? Or are they red? Yes, they're online, but I can see they're, they're probably in a meeting or doing something else, so I shouldn't expect a response. And I can get that information very, very rapidly. Can you send me that file? Can I have that phone number? How are you getting on with those projects? From there, what we can do is actually we can elevate that up into, I suppose, having a much more powerful and meaningful meeting. And Teams has the ability to give us uh, video conferencing and video chat. So what this means is in the scenario that we're in right now, we're able to elevate, you know, we've gone from a scenario where previously we would have had maybe 
one-on-one -on -one or one-to-many face-to-face meetings in the boardroom or, or the meeting room or even at a colleague's desk, we're now able to get a similar experience to that by using the, the inbuilt video calling within Teams. And we can do that on a one-to-one -one basis or we can also do it on a, on a one-to-many basis. What's also interesting about this is, in, in the context of how we work, is that this isn't just limited to people within our office or people that work in our business. We also have the ability to do video calling with our customers, with our partners, and engage with them in a, in a very, very effective way. Um, and it delivers that much more, I suppose, feature-rich or personal experience, whereby simply chatting on the phone or, or sending an email may not have that same personal approach. In addition, given that Teams is part of 365, it has all the native uh, Office features built in. So for example, I can work on my Word document, my Excel file, my PowerPoint document, while at the same time, people on the same project or in the same team as me are given commentary on that. Maybe they're saying, yes, this version is correct, or do you know what? We should create a new offer for these customers given the changes that have happened. We're able to collaborate very, very effectively, but also the key point being is all of that information is in context. It's built around a piece of work, a team, a project, or something that everyone can, can come together on. And what that means is, previously, if we think of the world where everything was siloed in my emails, if I want to start off a project with two or three people, and later I want to add in two or three more people, I can do that very easily, but they're able to get up to speed as to what happened on the project up to now. They can see all the conversation, they can see all the files, they can see all the versioning previous to that. So it's all built around getting that knowledge or collaborating much, much more effectively together. In addition, I suppose teams can be extended much further. So uh, as a business, I can say, hey, well, I have some data here that's maybe in Power BI. I want to surface that through teams. Maybe it's our latest sales forecast. It's information on our business performance. And if I have that in Power BI, I can natively surface that in teams. Again, from the point of view of saying, well, actually, why should I have to go off to some other third party application when I'm talking about a particular project or piece of work, I should be able to centralize everything around here. Look at the report, for example, in Power BI, look at the files associated with it, and look at the conversation in one place. I can also go even further, and I'll touch on, on this later on, as to how we can build applications in there to streamline our business processes. So we can use something called Power Apps to say, okay, well, if we had previous paper-based tasks, maybe we convert them into online tasks or, or an online tool right now and use Teams to surface that tool to our users very, very readily. So the one you're, you're seeing on screen right now is, is an example of one that Microsoft produced to say, hey, we need a, a crisis management tool. Let's put that together very, very quickly and let's use Teams to surface that and allow our staff to use our crisis management tool. So again, there could be lots of examples on that. So moving on slightly from Teams and thinking about, right, how does Microsoft 365 help us build our business? And, and that's something we all are conscious of, of right now not only stabilizing our business, but also helping us build our business and, and using tools that can allow our teams to work much more collaboratively and, collaboratively and effectively together. So one of the tools in building your business um, is Microsoft Planner. Again, this is part or core part of Microsoft 365. So it allows you to do project management or task management across your team. You know, for now working on a project from different locations and not only from different locations, but also from different working hours, we have to factor in that people may be you know, no longer working nine to five because they have to look after their kids. They could be starting at six o'clock in the morning, clocking off at 10 and back online at four o'clock in the evening until eight o'clock at night. So we want to have the ability to set up a project management and task management tool. A planner, which is built into Microsoft 365, it enables us to do that very, very easily and without any real project management or, or core skills about Gantt charts or any of that kind of stuff. We're able to set up a project, assign tasks to people, assign due dates to them and ultimately as someone who's managing a project or as a business owner see what's going on very very easily there. Bookings is, is another tool that, that's part of 365 and if we think about you know scenarios where we still want to engage with our customers but it's right now it's, it's very very challenging maybe we're able to send them out an email blast or, or pick up the phone to them but how about if our customers could book time with us and book a video consultation with us say, you know, I'm concerned about my finances or I want some more information about what your business can do for me. If we can give them a booking form, uh, spin that up very, very easily and allow them to book time with us or some of our team, we're given, a, I suppose, a better customer service approach, but also elevating that up into a video conversation where we're actually seeing our customers face to face, again, going back to that more personal approach. 
And one of the last areas around building your business is a, a solution that's built in there called Shifts, Microsoft Shifts. So again, we can manage our team, we can manage when they're working, the hours they're working, you know, what projects they're working on uh, in a tool that is very, very easily for, uh, and accessible for them. So while this may not be applicable for a lot of businesses now, you know, it very much relates to service sector businesses. We now have a tool there that uh, we can easily set up shifts and rotas and, and staff availability very, very easily. While all of that is great, and you know, I'm, not, I'm conscious that I am sweeping through this very, very rapidly, uh, and we do have, I suppose, deeper dive webinars coming up over the next few weeks. That technology is great, but it can only be as great uh, and, and, a, and a real advantage to our business. Number one, if we're using it effectively, but also number two, for securing it. Um, if we start opening up doors and opening up content and great ways of doing things, but uh, without thinking about security, we're opening our business up to real business risk and that fragmentation that I spoke about at the very, very start. So if we think about remote working in, in particular, really, what are the dangers? What, what are the threats to, to us right now? The first one is, is something we're seeing, you know, as being prevalent right now and much more prevalent than it ever was before is phishing. So Europol released a report there actually last Friday to say, you know, phishing is one of the top areas. Phishing and actually identity theft are one of the top areas that criminals are profiteering from uh, this whole COVID-19 scenario right now. Even the guards themselves on the Guard Info Twitter released something this morning to say, listen, be cautious online. Your personal data is at risk. You are being actively targeted. And really that goes back to, I suppose, where we're all right now, I suppose, looking for information. We're all tuned into the six o'clock news, looking for the latest numbers on COVID-19, what's update, what's happening. We're probably monitoring RTE.ie or our Twitter feed or monitoring LinkedIn to say, right, where can we consume more information? What's happening in the UK? What's happening in the US? What are the supports for business? So we're, we're naturally inclined to consume information. So it's very, very easy if we got an email in that looked like it was from the World Health Organization or looked like it was from the HSE, and we'd be very, very much inclined to click on that and, and to open up the content on that. Chances are that that is going to be a malicious email, and that malicious email is, is going to look to try and steal our credentials, infect our systems, steal our data, steal our customers' data. So how do we prevent against that, or how do we reduce the risk of that happening, given that fundamentally our guard is down, we're working from home, we have a lot going on, and it can be very stressful and difficult to, to realize what's going on. So one of the tools within Microsoft 365 to help reduce that is called Advanced Threat Protection. So what it does is it looks at all those emails, those phishing emails coming in, and it says, right, what happens when someone clicks on this email or what happens when someone opens up the attach attachment on this email? Does it go off to the World Health Organization site as it purported to do? Or does it go off and do something else and try to maybe download something in the background or, or try to access my system in, in some bad way? And if it does try to do anything that is out of the ordinary, what Microsoft 365 does is it blocks that. It says, hang on a second, this website is malicious. It's doing something bad. We're going to stop you from accessing it that. Likewise, if the attachment is bad, yes, this may look like a PDF, but in actual fact, it's downloading something in the background or it's doing uh, some kind of behavior that is not normal to a PDF. So instantly that gets blocked. So from a business point of view and from an end user point of view, you're protecting that that uh, end user and you're protecting your data very, very seamlessly uh, in, in a scenario where the chance of this happening have dramatically increased and ultimately our guard has, has been lowered. The second area is around identity theft. And, and again, this is something that has been around for a long, long time. And, you know, but I suppose the focus on it has been pushed uh, much more dramatically. And what is identity theft? So if, if we think about how do we get access to our corporate networks, how do we get access to our IT systems? For the majority of us, it's a simple username and password. And I alluded to the point earlier on that, you know, sometimes we're forced to create complicated passwords, but the reality is we put the number one at the end of them or the number two at the end of them every time we're forced to change them. And chances are we probably use that same password or a similar variation of that password on our Facebook, on our LinkedIn, and on, you know, a multitude of other services. And the picture I have on the screen right now is from a website called Have I Been Pawned? Um, it's a website created by uh, an Australian security researcher where he's trawled out on the internet and he said, right, are there freely available username and passwords from, you know, the Target hack, from the Boots hack, from the LinkedIn hack, from all the various hacks that have happened throughout the years? And the reality is they're out there fully open, easily accessible, you know, if you know what you're looking for. And what he's done is he's collated about nine and a half billion username and passwords together. Not that he's trying to sell these, but he's trying to inform people to say, look, guys, fundamentally, 
username and passwords are broken. They're a risk to your business. People have lost their credentials by various hacks on public facing websites. Chances are they're probably using the same credentials uh, on, on their work sites. So how do we protect against that? Again, given the scenario that we're no longer in the four walls of our office building, people are using home devices, people are using home networks. So the chances of identity theft being an issue has been elevated. So how do we protect against that with, with Microsoft 365? To get a little bit technical, we, we use something called uh, conditional access. And what this does is it looks at not only how the user is coming in, in other words, are they using a username and password? It looks at what device are they coming in at, what location are they coming in from, and what application are they trying to access? It then uses Microsoft's, I suppose, cloud knowledge and, and the billions of signals that Microsoft is getting in on a day-to-day -day basis about what's good, bad, or indifferent, and it rates that access. And it says, okay, we're gonna put in an extra layer of control on that. At the simplest level, that could be what's called multi-factor authentication. So what that means is I not only have to have a username and password, I also have to have a, an application on my phone that generates a random number. So I'm prompted for my username and password as normal, but I also have to enter in this random number that only appears on my phone. And the advantage there from a business point of view is that if my username and password or my identity has been compromised or stolen or someone else has tried to use it, the reality is they don't have my phone, so they can't have that random number at the same time. So therefore, they're not able to get access to our system. And with conditional access, we're able to, to layer that very, very effectively and say, okay, well, do we just want to prompt for multi-factor authentication or is that person coming in from a company owned device and we want to limit what they have access to? Maybe we only want to give them access to email, but we don't want to give them access to our files. Or ultimately, has this person tried to come in from a location that we don't know about on a device that isn't a company device and maybe they've entered their password wrong once or twice? Do you know what, in this scenario, the system behind the scenes is going to deny access or it's going to force that person to reset their password. So it's doing a lot of intelligent things there that you know you as a business don't have to worry about, that the end user doesn't have to worry about, but it's preventing um, access to your core systems if that user is compromised or if that user's identity is compromised. And it does that very, very intelligently. The third area, you know, again, thinking of remote working is devices. And like I said at the start, remote working is, is new for a lot of us right now. And while some of us have been provided with corporate devices, often that has been done very, very rapidly. Here's a laptop with a, a setup that was designed for in our office, but now you're using that same laptop for, or sorry, in your home environment with your home network where there's no real protection. And in addition on your home network, you've got your kids' mobile phones, maybe other laptops, maybe tablets that are playing games or going off to websites doing, God knows what. So we're now in a scenario where maybe our device isn't as secure as we want it to be, you know, and we don't know who's using it. And uh, maybe we not only have to use that device for work now, but our kids are using that device to, to watch Disney Plus on or to watch YouTube on or something like that. So from a business point of view, we actually don't really know what's going on with that device. So what Microsoft 365 does is, is it looks at, right, how do we start putting control on that device? How do we enforce that that device is encrypted? And when I say device, that could be any device. That could be a mobile phone, it could be a tablet, it could be a laptop, or it could be a full-blown PC. And how do we start to restrict control about on the apps that are on that, insofar as put PIN numbers on apps, uh, force certain types of login when people are coming in a different way, and even have the ability to remotely wipe a device. So we can get very, very granular about the control and about the management of those devices. Uh, for example, we can say, well, do you know what? Uh, if you want to access our corporate data, you have to have the latest Android phone. You cannot come in on older Android phones or older tablets, or you have to have antivirus fully installed on your Windows 10 uh, laptop. If you don't have antivirus, then the system will not allow you access. So lots of things that are subtly done behind the scenes. Again, from your end user's point of view, it's business as usual. There is no blockages. Everything is very, very seamless for them to get access to things. But from a business owner's point of view, we're now creating a scenario where we have much greater confidence in our security. And the last area then, you know, and there probably are many, many more, but the last core area, and again, I think in remote working and what the threats are, is around data. And I suppose as a business, data is probably one of our most valuable assets, you know, customers and employees notwithstanding. Our data is, is what our business is. So we really need to get an understanding right now as to, well, actually, where is our data? You know, 
is it on a new device, a device that uh, we've supplied to a member of staff, or are they using a device that they, they have at home that their kids use for their homework or that the, you know, someone else in, 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 the, um, in the home place works uses at the same time? So where is our data? Has it been downloaded and saved to the desktop? Has someone realized that it's very, very difficult to share files now that they're outside of the office? So they're using their Gmail account to share that data as well and, and using lots and lots of different tools and, and building more fragmentation back in, like I mentioned earlier on. So how do we prevent against that or reduce the risk of that happening? So that there are a number of ways we can do that. Um, one of them is, for example, using something called policy tips. So within our Outlook, you know, if someone tries to send an email externally, be it to a Gmail account or to a client or something like that, we can have a simple gray bar pop up to say, hey, did you realize you're actually sending this file externally? I'm not stopping you from doing it, but I'm just making you aware that you might want to think twice about doing that. And that's a, a very simple, gentle nudge for someone to think twice about, okay, yeah, actually, I shouldn't be doing that. Or we can extend that much, much further and say, well, hang on a second. The system recognizes that this attachment create or contains sensitive data. Maybe it's a PPS number, a bank number, some other piece of sensitive company data. And we have a policy set up to actually block that in full. So we can say, hang on a second, this type of document, you don't have authorization to send that to a Gmail account or an account that's outside of, of our normal work environment. And even we can extend that further in, in not only to email, but also to files. So for example, if someone uh, attaches a file to Gmail or puts a, a, a file into Dropbox or something like that, we can set rules around that file to say, well, number one, that file is always encrypted. But number two, that file has to be authorized. So in other words, if I double click on that file in three months time or six months time, I have to enter my username and password. And as long as my username and password is valid, I can still access that file. However, if my username and password isn't valid, I won't have access to that file. So it, in essence, it doesn't matter that it's sitting in Dropbox or it doesn't matter that it's sitting in someone's Gmail account. If they don't have the access or what's called the rights to, to open that file, they simply won't be able to get access to it. In addition, I can go much further with this and I can you know, use tools within Microsoft 365 like the ability to automatically encrypt emails. So again, if I'm engaging with my customers uh, around sensitive materials, sensitive files, uh, I can, with a simple one click, automatically encrypt those emails and, and have the knowledge that my data or the data that I'm transmitting to my customers is fully encrypted. Uh, there's lots of tools within there and lots of, I suppose, ways within Microsoft 365 to protect your data at a very, very granular level. And they're just some examples of it. So to move on, on from that, I suppose often we get asked the question, well, you know, I have Office 365 right now. What's different? What, what, what are you showing me here that's different? So for those of you who have Office 365, chances are this red box is your world right now. You have your office applications, you have your email and shared calendar in the cloud. You may have teams already and you may be sharing files and storing files in the cloud already. That's great. However, what we're really conscious of is the security aspect here. You know, we want to make sure we address those four areas around the phishing protection, the identity management, the device management and the data protection. And what Microsoft 365 gives you over and above Office 365 is those key secure areas. And how do, how do we find out or how does someone who has 365 already find out, well, how do I know if I'm secure or not secure? So Microsoft has, has introduced a, a tool within your 365 environment to say, well, actually, how secure are you? Um, if you go to security.microsoft.com, once you've logged in, it can actually show you what your current security rating is. And what that looks at, it looks at what services are you using? How are you using them? And compared to all the security elements that you could have turned on, what type of score do you see? And the one I put up on screen is, I suppose, typical of an awful lot of clients that we would see who are just using 365, or Office 365 and not Microsoft 365 and not turning on those security features is quite a low score there. So you can see across identity and data and device over on the left-hand side, everything's pretty low. So what we look to do is to work with a client and say, well, actually, how can we, in an effective fashion, and thinking about the four areas I called out earlier on, address those security issues, not make these into big projects and long-winded things, but quickly and sharply um, deliver or allow you to deliver remote access to your team in a more secure fashion. And we do that with a very, very simple approach. First and foremost, we want to secure the front door. So again, like I said, blocking those phishing emails, protecting people's identity, Ultimately, we want to make sure that your staff are getting a great work experience. So if we start introducing layers and layers of security that, again, are complicated and hard, 
and prevent people from doing their job, there's naturally going to be pushback. But not only that, people are going to find ways to circumvent it. So we need to be very, very conscious about that as, as we start this process. From there, we move on to actually saying, right, how do we manage your devices? How do we secure your devices, your laptops, your phones, your, your tablets, and make sure that they are secure, even though they're in a home working environment? And the last thing then, the last layer that we look at is how do we start to secure your content? How do we protect your data and protect those files? You know, if people start to go off piece with them or send them off to Gmail or, or put them on USB stick or, or whatever they may do with them, how do we protect against that? So we have a very, very structured and, and simple process to, I suppose, start uh, improving your security and protecting your network in a much, much better way as we move into this remote working ways. I suppose one thing to be conscious of, and, and this is just the last comment maybe before we move into questions, is uh, I, I used the point earlier on, a lot of these tools are great and uh, you know they can help with remote working and help businesses improve and keep going and, and add extra securities. It's important that we also factor in the human side of this, that we look at, okay, you know, this has been trusted upon people very, very rapidly. So we need to be conscious that, you know, we're encouraging our team to take breaks. We're encouraging them to take a break away from the technology, take your lunch break. We're also understanding that, you know, this is new to people and that they have a work-life balance. They've got family and maybe kids to look after and, and maybe neighbors and relatives to look after as, as well. And that we as, as colleagues and, and employers and employees are actually checking in on the rest of our team that we're saying, you know, hey, what, what's going on with you? I don't want to have a work video conference with you. I actually want to have a, a virtual coffee with you. Something we've started to introduce in Action Point is that we've started to do virtual coffees. We've even started to do virtual wine o'clock uh, on Friday afternoons as well to bring in that, I suppose, organic conversation that heretofore was done as people bumped into each other in the hallway or as people chatted in the canteen but almost as much as possible or as best as possible using these tools within Microsoft 365 to continue somewhat that cultural aspect within the business. So that's been a kind of sweeping overview of, of Microsoft 365, how it can help your business, you know, from a productivity and collaboration point of view, but also how it can start to secure things and make sure that your business and your, your business data is protected as, as, you, uh, as, as this remote working uh, continues. So I think I'll open it up to questions there, Peter. I think there might be a few in the chat box. Yeah, perfect. Um, Finney, and thanks a million uh, for another brilliant, for another great presentation on uh, M365 and the elements within the platform. Um, glad you finished on um, specifically around productivity and maybe the more holistic side. I'm just going to ping straight to the poll that we carried out at the beginning of the webinar, and um, we'll get to the questions in the chat box. Um, questions are pretty light as well, guys. So please do get your questions in. Uh, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And and look, we're here. We're here to help. Um, um, we're here to we're here to help. We're here to answer any questions. So anything at all around remote working, um, be it security or productivity, uh, please do get them in the chat box. We'll be happy to answer them. And um, poll results. Actually, we ran this poll yesterday on a different webinar. Uh, very similar um, results on this. So so the question in the poll was, what's was the biggest challenge you experienced in regard to remote working? Um, not unusual, the, 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 not surprising, I suppose, the distractions in the home office being, being number one. Uh, communication with your team, be it social or professional, being number two. Uh, general productivity um, and, and connectivity are all kind of ranking highly. Um, Finian, would you like to comment on the poll, maybe around the distractions in the home office, and, and have you any advice for people out there who might be struggling to you know, distinguish between work and, 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 and personal life? Yeah, I, I think it's something that comes up an awful lot, Peter, at the moment. And, and really, you know, it, it's about setting boundaries or trying as best you can to set boundaries about saying, well, you know, number one, this is my workspace and have your workspace, regardless of where that is, be it in the back bedroom or at the end of the kitchen table or in the living room or somewhere like that, as your workspace and, and almost avoiding that when you're not in work mode and only treating that as a workspace when you're in work mode. As well as that, I, I suppose it's, you know, working with your colleagues and making them aware to say, listen, I have three kids here. I'm going to be minding them. There are going to be interruptions. And I think, you know, based on the, the amount of, of video calls I've been on over the last number of weeks, there's a real tolerance for that. And, uh, and not so much a tolerance, but almost an acceptability of that. Everyone's in the same boat here. This isn't something unique to you or, or to, to certain individuals. So there's a real acceptance of that in, in business. And the line I actually picked up on yesterday from someone was, uh, they had the comment, well, actually, you're not, you're not working from home. You're at home during a crisis trying to work. So I think that that way of thinking about things, you know, this is a crisis. This is something you, you're trying your best. 
but try to use those things, those tools around setting boundaries and setting times for you to work and, and concentrate effectively um, as best you can. Super, uh, thanks for that, Finney. And um, I, just on the communication piece, I, I think you touched on it quite well at the end, is is keeping those informal conversations as well as the formal ones. Um, I, I've enjoyed the the the, the, the virtual coffees as, as much as the wine o'clock. So they've been brilliant and um, it's great to get people connected. Um, I think from our own perspective, we always advise people to keep their camera on, um, especially in these times, um, the tangibility of, of a visual uh, can't be underestimated. Um, I'm gonna jump into the questions uh, here. Um, so um, yeah, we have a few in here now. I'll just uh, roll them up for you. So, um, Maria Gleason, um, do you recommend Microsoft Teams for webinars like this one? It, it depends, I suppose, is, is the non-straight answer, Maria. So, we've actually delivered this same presentation via Teams, directly via Teams. It works seamlessly, and the screen sharing, the video, all of those kind of things work really well. I suppose the key difference is using the software that we're using today, which we're using GoToWebinar, is that it does all that back-end management. So the managing the invites, the managing the polls, all of those kind of things, go to webinar does really, really well. Whereas Teams doesn't actually do that. I suppose Teams is designed to be a much more flexible and general tool. 100% it will allow you to deliver web, deliver a webinar no more than it will a, a video conference with, with your team or, or a one-on-one -on -one conversation with one of your clients. Yeah, just to comment on that, Maria, I suppose I'm the I'm the guy behind the scenes who puts the webinars on and I, I, I think Teams is quite close to being a, a, a good webinar tool. Um but but you are just, just like and they've added live video as well for, for, for these types of events. Um they're just there's there's small things around the registration pages which, which Finian mentioned and maybe some of the, the analytics and reporting off the back of the webinar. So we're able to see um engagement rates and, and engagement throughout the webinar um off the back of go to webinar. So I think from a audio visual perspective and actually from a usability perspective, it's fantastic. Um it's just missing some of the, the key components I think for, for 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 a good webinar. But um I think it's something that will happen um, um, soon. So um, just on another question here from Dan, uh, can you do quick poll in Teams? Uh, in Teams, in so two ways of thinking about Teams. One is a, a general Teams call. No, you can't do quick polls. Secondly is about Teams live events. And in, when you're using the, the live events functionality, uh, yes, you can do polls in it. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, just uh, Edward, uh, Edward, Edward wrote in there. Was just wondering if this session is being recorded. Uh, and will I be able to share this with others afterwards? As your explanation is much better than I could deliver it uh, to managers. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for the compliment, Edward. Yes, the the session will be uh, recorded. It is recorded, um, and we will be sending it out directly after the webinar, um, along with Finian's slides from today as well. So feel free to share, to use, to um, uh, uh, any way you please. Um, highly recommend it. Um, question from John here. How do we assess what is safe to use when provided an invite to events, even such as this, never use GoToWebinar before? How do we assess what is safe to use when provided an invite to events? You know, yeah. it, it, it's multiple aspects. So, you know, I, I've been very much talking today about the technology aspects. So number one, it's important that you have the correct technology protection in, in place using things like phishing, thing, like phishing uh, protection and those kind of things. Secondly, I, I suppose it's about trust. It's about you know looking around you and going, okay, Action Point have sent me an email, um, or the Limerick Chamber have sent me an email with uh, a link to a webinar on it. Right? Do I can I go to the Limerick Chamber site or go to the Action Point site? Are they making that public? Are they promoting that on their social channels? You know, maybe I'm not very confident. Maybe it's something more specific whereby. They've asked me for certain details, banking details, or to transfer funds or something like that. Well, in, in those scenarios where I need to use my gut instinct and say something's not right here, I pick up the phone. I pick up the phone to the organization and say, hey, I've got an email from you. I wasn't expecting it. What is this about? Is this actually real here? So I think it's a balancing act between trust, expectation, uh, technology feeds into it as, as well, but being critically aware to say, well, actually, am I expecting this in or not? Do I normally get a communication in from the Limerick Chamber. If I do, what does that normally look like? Am I expecting one today? Is this normal kind of thing? So it's a lot of those aspects. And I suppose there is no silver bullet. It's like fundamental IT security. There is no silver bullet, but all of these things are just layers that you can add in to, to increase your awareness. 
Very good. Uh, thank you for that, Finian. Uh, question from Anya. I checked Limerick Chamber site to check if it was legit too. Um, are we becoming, I think it was more paranoid, uh, was the question there. Yeah, I, I don't think people are becoming more paranoid. I think people are just aware. More suspicious, that, sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, th I think people are just, there's a heightened awareness and, and heightened awareness is good. It doesn't need to prevent us from doing work, but we just need to be aware that um, you know, as best intentions as, as all our work is here and everyone else here trying to deliver a good service um, to the public and to the world or to whoever, there are people out there who will try to exploit those best intentions and find ways to socially engineer and, and get around um, when our guard is down, you know. Yeah, fair point. And look, um, there's, there's, there's an element of caution that you can apply to all of your online activity, but uh, I, I, I don't think... Um, you, you know, you know, you have to enjoy what you're doing as well, and and uh, not not become too suspicious. I suppose is the is the, is the answer there. And Finian, just specifically, I, I suppose on the practicalities of you know, you, you talked a lot about the security features in Microsoft 365 Teams. If we look at just email, and maybe just go back to that point on the the flags that that M365 can set up and. I guess we get the policy, but you know how how difficult or how difficult are these things to set up? How long does it take? Um, if I'm a, if I'm a, a business owner at home now, when I I, I want to make sure I have phishing detection and malware detection on my email, um, how, how easy is that to to toggle on within my M365? So it, it it depends again, like like many of my answers, it's an it depends one. It's, it's down to what level you want, but you know some of these features, for example, phishing protection can be turned on in a matter of minutes. Some of the more advanced features like turning on multi-factor authentication and enabling that, again, they can be quite quick to turn on, but the, the time limit is around, or the time factor there is around uh, getting all your staff accustomed to it, making sure it's on their devices and those kind of things. As we move into the aspects around data protection and encrypting data and putting rights management on data, those aspects, while technically are relatively straightforward to enable, is the planning around them. How do you actually want them to work in reality? They're the things that actually take time. So if you looked at my slide there where I had around you know, the four key areas, step number one being secure the front door, they're the kind of areas that are very, very uh, quick to enable for our business and that certainly your IT provider, and again, Action Point are more than happy to talk to you about that, uh, can enable very, very quickly. But as we step down the chain, certainly things can get more and more complicated. Um, but they do from, from the reason that we want to plan things out very, very well so that ultimately we still deliver that great user experience back to your employees. Excellent. A uh, quick uh, question from John on Teams. Uh, in Teams, I have an issue in that the video image gets rotated 90 degrees. So far not been able to rectify this or seen a nice solution online. The video is getting rotated 90 degrees. I wonder if that's on his phone or his laptop. Yeah, um, it's hard to know. If, if it was yesterday, Peter, I, I might be saying turn your head 90 degrees as well, but it's no longer <laughs> a full space. So um, I think that one should be just a simple fix. It, it could be just a setting on your webcam or something like that. But uh, if you want to reach out to our support team, they'd be happy to look into it in more detail. Yeah, totally. And I, I just left a link, guys, to next week's webinar, which which is uh, focused on Microsoft Teams. Um, it's an Ask Me Anything where Finian uh, looks at Microsoft Teams in detail and then opens the floor to any questions. Um, so they've been very engaging sessions the last couple of weeks and we'll continue to run them. So, so check out the link there in the chat box. Um, okay, uh, qu a question from Chris and loads of questions coming in, guys. Thanks a million. Um, is Microsoft 365 designed to replace the conventional file sharing database or are they to work side by side? So again, like many of my answers, again, Chris, and apologies for this, it's an it depends one. So for example, some businesses that we work with, absolutely, they use all their file sharing within Microsoft Teams. They're fully cloud-based, they've moved all their files up there and it works fully for them. Other businesses for reasons to do with their line of business applications, maybe I'm using a case management system or a CRM system or, an accounts package that needs my files sitting on a file server. Some of those businesses have chosen to, to leave part of their files or all of their files locally beside that application by virtue of the way that application works. Naturally, you know, we can take that full application out and we can bring it up to the cloud using different tools, not using Microsoft 365. So certainly there are ways and means. And again, other clients have adopted that. So there is no, I suppose, yes or no answer on this or, or, or very clear cut answer on this. It depends on how you're working, but for a lot of businesses, absolutely, they, they've migrated their, their files fully up there. 
And for them, certainly in the remote working world, it gives them key advantages. They don't have to worry about their office and even outside of remote working, um, you know, in the situation we all find ourselves in right now, they're able to adapt and be very, very flexible on a continuous basis. Uh, so I have a couple of questions around the video. Thanks, Stephanie. I have a couple of questions around the video functionality within Teams. Uh, one here is from Neve. Um, can I ask, is there only a certain number of people who can use video conference on Teams? Is there a limit on the number of people who, that can join? When would it be better to use Zoom or is Teams a safer platform? Very new to video conferencing, so it could be a very basic question. Never a basic question, Neve. Um, so, Finian, can you maybe address that for, for Neve, please? I can indeed, and I've actually put something up the, on the screen there which addresses that. So, you know, one thing I did mention on the call is that Microsoft is constantly changing, it's constantly iterating the product, and it's not, you know, every three years they're iterating, it's every day that they're iterating, and sometimes it's every hour. And um, so, we see a lot of change in the products and a lot of improvements on the product on a continuous basis. So this request for more video feeds or more uh, video windows through Teams has been one of the top requests. And you'll see it actually there on, on a thing called user voice. So this is where Microsoft looked for feedback from the public and say, what type of things would you like to see? And that request is actually the number one. A week ago, that actually had 8,000 volts. It now is 26,000. And two days ago, we got the response there. You'll see where it says Alex is working on it. Alex is one of the key people on the engineering team and has updated that status as of two days ago to say we are actively working on this. It's our number one priority right now. So I would expect that in days or possibly weeks that we'll see um, an increase in the number of video screens. Right now it's four um, and it's, uh, it, it's going to be increased much more than that. To answer the second part of your question, I suppose, if you, if you remember my first slide where I put up about this fragmentation approach about people using lots of different tools and people going off piste and you know, using tools that the business simply had, had an awareness of. As much as possible, we try to keep people in, in the, I suppose, the vein of using the business tools that have been given to them. So if, if we as a business have invested in Microsoft 365, well, therefore all our staff should use Microsoft Teams for our video conferencing, for our project management. If we start to encourage people going off to one side of that, maybe using Zoom for uh, video conferencing, maybe using Dropbox for file sharing, maybe using another tool, gradually the number of tools will increase. It'll increase the burden on people going, which tools do I use when, but also it will increase the risk to our business. So really our advice to people is stay focused when business tools, absolutely there will be limitations at times and sometimes uh, a vendor will come out and say, hey, we can do things better than that. But it's about looking at, okay, what's the bigger picture here? What's the integrated approach and what's best for our business? Okay, brilliant. Um, we're going to try and fly through some of these uh, questions, Finian. Um, so, uh, is Wi-Fi controlled at source through the router, or can 365 control the usage for home use? Edward, thank you. Uh, really, Edward, Wi-Fi and, and 365 are two separate things. I suppose your, your Wi-Fi is how maybe your laptop, your home device is connecting to your, your internet. In terms of using 365, it really doesn't make any difference how you connect into it. Um, the only time that there's a difference there is how your organization has set up, has set things up. In other words, are you allowed to connect over or a company owned device or a home device? Um, what type of connections can you connect over? So your home Wi-Fi really doesn't have any bearing or, or doesn't come into the mix there. Obviously, if you've got poor connectivity, um, you're going to be restricted not only with Microsoft 365, but with any online service. Uh, Paul Brown um, has a similar question to Neve about limits are in teams for video screens and meetings. So it's four currently, Paul, but as Finian mentioned, uh, it's something that's been actively worked on. Um, we're currently using Microsoft for most of our office work, but I'm not using Zoom for conference calls. Is Microsoft Teams as easy to use? Yeah, Sinead, it's, 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 it's as simple to use. And I think as Finian mentioned there, it's a single pane at last. It's your chat, your project management, and now your conference calling as well. Um, so yeah, couldn't. Um, couldn't uh, uh, you know? It, 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 it's a it's a very very good tool. Um, so I have another question here, Peter Jones. Uh, not quite related, but how expensive is it to use SharePoint for a company using a lot of data? Say 250 users and 2,000 contractors contractors accessing data on a shared web platform. Just a document revision and ability to work from anywhere is something do with a different platform. It's a very long question, Peter, but thanks for asking. Can you, can you, can you address some of the points on that? Yeah, no, I'll try best. And, and certainly, Peter, if, if you, my email address is on the screen, if you want to mail me after, I, I can certainly follow up with you. But fundamentally, you know, 
the limits on on SharePoint are extremely large. So from a storage point of view, out of the box, you're given one terabyte of storage. So even if you just have one user on the system, you're given a terabyte of storage. So there are no real storage requirements. It really comes down to what those 2,000 contractors are doing. Um, you know, if you have 250 users, that's a very, very small uh, SharePoint instance. And if you have 2,000 contractors, again, that's, you know, quite small in, in the grand scheme of things. But it comes down to what they're actually doing on it, how how heavily they're interacting with the system. Are they uploading and download, downloading a, a, a lot of information on a continuous basis? And by continuous, I mean minute by minute, hour by hour. Or is it something that they're just dipping in and dipping out of? Um, more than happy to take that question offline with you and, and go into more details. I think so, yeah. I think that's an interesting one and one for offline. But thank you for the question, Peter. Uh, Shawnee Ryan uh, is in. Uh, he wants to, uh, I suppose, the issue of uh, data and Facebook and, and, and some of the leaks we've been seeing lately. Maybe give some advice regarding all the issues coming out with Zoom at the moment, giving data to Facebook, no end-to-end -end encryption, installer on Mac bypassing install standards like malware does, and issues of calls being hijacked. People should avoid Zoom. Is is Shawnee's opinion there? Um, Finian, any 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 thoughts on that? I, I know it's. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go down the route of, about I suppose bashing other providers or, or commenting on what, what's out in the media. Certainly, Zoom are you know have, have done a lot of good and are doing a lot of good out there right now with their tool. Whatever flaws are, are in that, I, I'm not going to comment on. But I think I would always go back to the point is about business tools. So again, if my organisation is or is using Microsoft 365, I therefore have the capability to use Teams, I have the license to use Teams, so that's what I should be using, that's what my staff should be using, that's what I should be encouraging them to use. You know, it, it is very easy to look at, um, you know, the fields are greener, far away kind of thing, and, and maybe Zoom has more video uh, boxes than Teams does, that's fine, but what risk does it introduce to my business, what complexity does it introduce to my staff, so I'd be very much of the opinion, of the opinion focus in on what we have, and let's use the tools that that are um, uh, that are given to us as best as possible. Brilliant, Finian. Thank you so much, guys. We we've uh, we haven't got much more time for questions, but thank you for all the the engagement. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's it's great to be able to chat with the Limerick Chamber members today on on this important topic. Um, for more information on what Action Point are doing within remote working, check out actionpoint.e forward slash uh, remote working. Um, if you also check out actionpoint.e forward slash academy, um, all our upcoming webinars are published there. And I've left a link in the chat box for our next um, for, for, for our next event. Mary, um, a few closing comments from you, if you will, um, before we close out today's session. Yeah, no problem. Um, just to say thank you so much to everyone for staying online, staying engaged um, and attending um, this afternoon's event. Um, thanks a million to Finian and Peter for hosting it. Um, it's been very informative. I've learned loads. I know um, within four, it takes four minutes um, to um, get get attacked um, on your phishing emails. Um, and um, I suppose stay tuned for um, more upcoming webinars on limitchamber.ie. Thank you very much, Mary, and thank you for giving us the opportunity. Guys, we'll leave it there. Enjoy your lunch and enjoy the rest of your day. And we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thank you. Thanks.